didn't use it, I put... I'm not dead. Yeah. He says he's not dead. Yes, he is. I'm not. He isn't? Well, he will be soon. He's very ill. I'm getting better. No, you're not. You'll be stone dead in a moment. Oh, I can't take him like that. It's against regulations. I don't want to go on the car. Oh, don't be such a baby. I can't take him. I feel fine. Well, do us a favour. I can't. Well, can you hang around a couple of minutes? He won't be long. No, I've got to go to Robinson's. They've lost nine today. <sighs> well, when's your next run? Thursday. You think I'll go for a walk? You're not fooling anyone, you know. Look. Isn't there something you can do? I feel happy! I feel happy! Ah, oh, thanks very much. Not at all. See you on Thursday. Right! right. Who's that then? I don't know. Must be a king. Why? He hasn't got shit all over him. That clip comes from a very famous comedy film called Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And some of you may or may not have seen it, but it is one of the most iconic comedy movies ever made. So if you haven't seen it yet, please go check it out. Um, but in this particular scene, what you can see is kind of a comical depiction of the infamous epidemic that we know of as the Black Death. So last week we talked about how the Mongols were basically responsible for spreading the Black Death to Europe because they opened up trade across the continent. And now we're going to look at what the impact of the Black Death was on Europe and the devastation that it wrought across the continent. So, you know, while that clip is really hilarious, um, the Black Death itself was anything but. Um, this plague of the 14th century killed about 25 million people across Europe. Um, that's about one-third of the current population at the time of the plague. So if you've ever watched the Avengers movies, which, you know, most of the world has, so I hope you get this reference, um, that is pretty close to the same level of devastation as Thanos' snap, where 50% of the population was, you know, erased from society. And so, you know, this is 33%. That's an insanely high number. And it caused major dysfunction and political turmoil um, all across Europe um, just because of this plague. So the plague itself, um, it's called, it's a, it's a form of bubonic plague. Um, and it basically, it invades the bodies of rats. It often kills the rats, but before the rat dies, the germ is often picked up by fleas that live on the rat's body. And then the germ doesn't kill the flea, but it actually multiplies in the flea's stomach. And then the flea goes and bites other rats or humans, injecting them with the killer germs. And the name bubonic comes from the type of inve infection that this plague spread. Um, and the infection were these large pus-filled boils, which were called buboes that would appear on a victim's body uh, within days of contracting the illness. And that, in combination with a whole host of other horrific symptoms, would usually leave the victim dead in about three days. So there are actually still cases of bubonic plague in the world today, surprisingly, but it's now a curable disease because of the use of antibiotics. But they did not have any antibiotics in the Middle Ages, and so it was an absolutely devastating disease. Along with the devastation of its population, Europe also faced some pretty serious political and spiritual threats in the early modern period. The greatest political threat it was facing was the Hundred Years' War between Britain and France, and the greatest spiritual threat was a threat to another permanent division in the church, um, and this time it was over the issue of who should be Pope. So the Hundred Years' War lasted from 1337 to 1453, so technically over a hundred years, but I'll get to in a minute just why this term hundred years can be easily de deconstructed. Uh, but it began because Philip VI of France and Edward III of England, uh, they were both on really terrible terms over who should control the region of English Gascony, uh, which was around Bordeaux in southern France and they started battling over who should control the territory. And the war became really hard to end because both French and English royalty claimed to have the proper right to the throne and the territory in France. Um, it escalated into this intermittent war from starting in 1337 that was marked by uh, numerous English cavalry raids across France that were sometimes met by the French in pitched battles and that the French tended to lose. In 1356, one famous battle is the Battle of Poitiers, uh, which resulted in the capture of the French King John II, and the resultant peace gave the English an enormously enlarged Gascony in the south of France. 
And those territorial gains, however, were eaten away by cavalry raids by the French, and those English gains were mostly lost by the 1370s. So you have this back and forth as depicted in this map of the territory and the terrain of the Hundred Years' War. One really famous battle I really want to talk about is the Battle of Agincourt. And this is a famous, famous battle in history that began when the war was really moving in earnest with attacks from Henry V of England, uh, beginning in 1415. So after several decades of relative peace, the English resumed the war in 1415 amid a failure of negotiations with the French. So in this ensuing campaign, many soldiers um, from the English camp were dying of disease and their numbers were dwindling. And they were trying to withdraw to English-held Calais in the north of France, but found that their path had been blocked by a much larger French army. So this huge battle at uh, the French city of Agincourt begins, and despite the numerical disadvantage, the battle ends in an overwhelming victory for the English. And in the battle, King Henry V of England leads his troops into battle and participates in hand-to-hand -hand combat himself. Um, the king of France did not commit... Uh, did not participate in the battle because apparently he suffered from a psychotic illness and associated mental incapacity. And the battle is notable for its use of the English longbow in very large numbers, with the English and Welsh archers comprising nearly 80% of Henry's army. So the Battle of Agincourt has become one of England's most celebrated victories. And if anyone has ever seen the Netflix film The King, starring Timothy Chalamet, that is what it's about. So after the battle, a full-scale war of conquest began again in northern France, and that brought half the country under English hegemony by 1429, and even Paris was in English hands from 1420 to 1436. And for all intents and purposes, it looked like England was going to be the long-term victor of the Hundred Years' War. However, thanks to one young woman, Joan of Arc, the tide began to turn in favor of the French. So Joan of Arc is also called the Maid of Orleans, and she is considered a heroine of France for her role in the Hundred Years' War. Joan was born to a peasant family in northeastern France, and in 1428 she uh, requested to be taken to Charles VII of France because she claimed that she had received visions from the Archangel Michael, St. Margaret, and St. Catherine, and they had instructed her to support Charles and recover France from English domination. So after their meeting, Charles actually sends Joan out into the war, and she's about 17 years old at this point, and so she joins the French army at the Siege of Orleans as part of the relief army. And so she arrives at the city on April 29th, 1429, quickly gains prominence for her role in the fighting. Uh, the siege was lifted only nine days after she arrived, and then after participating in several more French victories, Charles was consecrated again as the King of France in Reims Cathedral, and Joan was at his side. So Joan became seen as this beacon of hope for the French army and the source of their recent victories. Now, unfortunately, in early 1430, Joan was actually captured by Burgundians and exchanged to the English. So she was put on trial by a pro-English bishop on a charge of heresy, and she was declared guilty and subsequently burned at the stake on May 30th, 1431, which is actually my birthday, by the way, which is really sad. Anyway, she died at about the age of 19 years old. Um, however, thankfully, in 1456, a French inquisitorial court nullified the whole trial's verdict, declared it tainted by deceit and procedural errors, and Joan was exonerated posthumously. And since her death, Joan has been popularly revered as a martyr. And after the French Revolution, in the 18th century, she became a no national symbol of France and was even canonized as a saint in 1920. Now, back in the Hundred Years' War, by 1450, the English had lost all their post-1415 conquests, and in 1453, they lost Bordeaux as well. And eventually, after spending over a century bickering over whether France belonged to England or France, everyone simply agreed it belonged to France. Also, as a quick side note, uh, for large sections of the hundred years of this war, there wasn't actually any fighting. It was often punctuated by treaties and marriages that brought peace. And in addition, wars between the French and the English 
had already begun in 1294, well before the Hundred Years' War period, and it didn't actually really end until the English lost their last French mainland possession, Calais, in 1558. So the particular period of this war as a hundred years is really easily deconstructed, but it is important to understand this dynamic of the rivalry between England and France because it would continue on long after even these wars ended, and not just over territory in Europe, but over territory in the New World and other various colonial exploits of the European countries in the modern age. Now, besides the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War, Europe was facing one other threat to its established structure, and this was a threat to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And it actually started with the appearance of a few really popular fiction writers who wrote novels for the entertainment of the mass masses written in vernacular languages, so that's the local languages of people, rather than the high language of Latin, which was the language of the church. And what these authors did is they kind of undermined the authority of the church by writing about church leaders in a kind of satirical, negative way. And we'll be looking at three key authors who are a part of the shift that was going on in Europe at this time. The first was Dante Alighieri, and he was born in Florence, Italy in 1265. Um, and was a very highly politicized person, and his political beliefs are reflected in his writings. He held some pretty radical beliefs for his time, mainly that he believed that the emperor should have more power than the pope. As a result of his outspokenness about this issue, he was actually exiled from Florence. His greatest work, The Divine Comedy, was written in Italian so that the common man could be able to read it and understand it. And it conveys his beliefs and also points out the corruption that had been growing in the church and its increasing focus on power, money, and land. So his writings add to this growing unrest of the citizens, which would soon become full-blown into the Reformation just two centuries later. The Divine Comedy is divided in three phases, Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradise. And these, his concepts of these places are really not strictly Christian teaching. And in fact, in many instances, he had entirely made up the contents of places like hell and purgatory and heaven um, because he was trying to emphasize his political beliefs. But he was drawing elements from church doctrine. So it can be really confusing when you read it because you're like, is this what Christians believe or is this something Dante made up? And it can be pretty hard to parse that out. Um, the only section of his book that I want to focus on is the Inferno phase. It's iconic um, because it's Dante's vision of hell. And he envisioned it as a place with nine levels, each one getting worse and worse and more painful with the level of atrocities committed by its inhabitants. So the worse sins you committed in your lifetime, the, the further down in hell you would be, and whatever level you were might have more and more painful um, punishments. And the final level is reserved for who Dante saw as the greatest evildoers. Now again, this is not church doctrine, this is Dante's view. He saw betrayers as the ultimate worst people in society who deserve to have the most suffering in hell. The deepest circle of hell is reserved for betrayers and mutineers. Chaucer was another author like Dante, but he lived in England, and he wrote in the English vernacular, and his books mixed historical people with classical people in an effort to show culture and comment on the church. And his most famous work is The Unfinished Canterbury Tales, which is a set of 24 tales told by 30 pilgrims on their way to visit some ancient relics. And the tales were judged by each of these pilgrims on two things, how well they portrayed morality and how much pleasure they gave to the, the listeners. And throughout the tales, Chaucer also gives his own view on the church, monks, government, etc. And he's really, it's a very negative view in a lot of times, uh, showing monks and uh, priests committing philandering adulterous acts and not being faithful and not being holy people and that was really shocking for a lot of readers to see holy men described in these profane ways. So as Dante and Chaucer are writing in their own languages and making fun of monks and priests and beginning to tear down the authority of the church in this indirect fashion, John Wycliffe was a man who created a translation of the Bible into the vernacular that directly challenged the authority of Rome. Um, he also wrote essays telling people what the Bible really taught and how the Roman church needed to change. 
As more scholars and influential people spoke out against the church, the balance of power began swinging decidedly in the direction of individual nations and their governments and away from the church. And as if this weren't enough for the church to deal with, it also had problems of its own. And due to power struggles between France and Italy, each state elected its own pope. And for a few years, there were actually three popes in Europe. Um, this became known as the Great Papal Schism, but it eventually was mended and the popes emerged from it, unfortunately, with a very much decreased power and authority. So you have these things, the Hundred Years' War, the Black Death, and the decreasing authority of the church eroding away European society. But surprisingly, this doesn't result in a period of economic depression, or quite the opposite. Economically and culturally, Europe is flourishing at this point. And this period of cultural flourishing in the midst of economic flourishing is known as the Renaissance. The French word renaissance means rebirth, and it refers to a period of artistic and intellectual creativity that took place from the 14th to the 16th century and that reflected the continuing development of a very sophisticated urban society, particularly in Western Europe. Um, during the Renaissance, painters, sculptors, and architects drew inspiration from classical Greek and Roman artists rather than from their medieval predecessors from the church. Uh, they admired the convincing realism of classical sculpture and the stately simplicity of classical architecture. And in their efforts to revive classical aesthetic standards, they actually transformed European art. Renaissance scholars uh, known as humanists looked to classical rather than medieval literary models, and they sought to update medieval moral thought and adapt it to the needs of a bustling urban society. The term humanist referred to scholars interested in the humanities, literature, history, moral philosophy, and it should not be confused with the more modern concept of humanism that is used today. Um, humanism today really means like strict secularism and kind of even anti-religious interests, but Renaissance humanists were deeply committed to Christianity. We talked before about how important mon the monasteries were during the Middle Ages for recording texts from ancient Greeks and Romans and um, texts from far and wide across the world and recording them and copying them. And it was during the Renaissance that these monastic libraries in Italy, Switzerland, and southern France, uh, hundreds of Latin writings were discovered. Um, the, these writings that medieval scholars often overlooked, even though medieval monks were copying them down. They weren't considered as important. And during the 15th century, Italian humanists became well acquainted with Byzantine scholars and enlarged the body of classical Greek as well as Latin works available to scholars. And these kinds of readings from the ancient era really shaped Renaissance thought. Now, along with a lot of the things they were learning from these ancient texts, there were some important movers and shakers of the Renaissance that had a huge influence. That's because it was only possible for there to be a Renaissance because of the incredible wealth flowing into city-states like Florence and Venice. And this wealth allowed for a complicated society that divided responsibilities of agriculture, governance, and military power to exist. And it allowed for some members of the population to focus on other pursuits in the arts and literature. And they were funded by wealthy merchants. One family in particular known for their patronage of the arts was the Medici family. The Medici family ruled Florence and they played an enormous role in its political and cultural history first as wool merchants and bankers, later as dukes, princes, and even a pope. Lorenzo Medici was a tremendous patron of the arts and assisted many artists, including Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Botticelli. And they were not only wealthy, but powerful. And Pope Leo X was actually a member of the Medici family, and he also was a tremendous patron of the arts. Now, living at the same time as the Medici family, family, and in particular, Pope Leo X, was this very interesting man, a statesman named Machiavelli. And he wrote an incredibly controversial book called The Prince. Um, it was a rational analysis of political power. And he looked at the actions of the Medicis and Pope Leo X as his models, um, because he saw these men, they were ruthless and cunning in all their pursuits, yet they were still incredibly successful. They weren't these morally righteous, upstanding individuals. They were pretty intense and self-serving, uh, but they were successful. Now, treatises of this kind that kind of like analyzed the role of those in power 
princes and popes and such, that that's what was very popular at the time. Uh, but in general, these kinds of writings would argue for the importance of ruling elites being highly moral individuals who embodied Christian values. And Machiavelli's work was very different because he argued that a ruler must be prepared to do evil if he judges that good will come of it. And he is famous for stating that the ends justify the means. So that meant that princes, according to Machiavelli, were most successful when they ignored moral codes and made judgment calls regardless of ethical consequences as long as they viewed a greater good in the end of all of their actions. Now, some rulers were really drawn to Machiavelli's thinking and others were horrified by it. Regardless of whether his philosophy is right or not, it had a huge impact on the Renaissance era and beyond. Now, there were a host of incredibly important artists, sculptors, writers, thinkers that came out of the Renaissance area, but we only have time to look at four of them. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Botticelli. Now, I want to warn you guys, I am going to be testing you on how well you know the actual paintings of these four men. Uh, we're going to go over it here. I'm going to make it very clear, but you will need to be able to identify the name of a painting and who created it. Okay, so pay attention to that and study that because you will be tested on it. So to begin with, Michelangelo was a very gifted sculptor um, and he saw his forms. It, my, to begin with, Michelangelo was a very gifted sculptor and he said that he saw his forms within the marble before him, before he even started sculpting and all he did was just work to chip away the stone around the form to free it, which is such a beautiful concept. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. His most recognizable sculpture is the David, but he is also very famous for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which he reluctantly agreed to do because he was more of a sculptor than a painter. Uh, but then he spent four years bending backward and hanging upside down on a 60-foot scaffold, painting scenes from the Bible and from the classical world. Truly an incredible man. Then we have Leonardo da Vinci, who was the ultimate Renaissance man. He was a painter, a sculptor, an architect, an engineer, a weapons designer, an inventor. His overabundance of talents caused him to often treat his artistry very lightly, and he seldom finished a painting. But those that he did finish were of unsurpassing beauty and excellence, and his two most famous works are The Mona Lisa and The Last Supper. I hope you are already familiar with these paintings, so this should be an easy part of this test. But if you're not, get familiar with this stuff because these are hugely important paintings in the world today. Next, we have Raphael, who was a painter and an architect. And he did most of his painting in Florence, um, and he was responsible for painting the School of Athens, which we actually talked about in our week on Greece and Persia. It depicts Plato and Aristotle talking about their views of the world and all the famous f classical thinkers of their era, which really captures how important studying the classics was to these Renaissance thinkers. Next, we have Botticelli, and I was really tempted to go with Donatello for our fourth Renaissance man, just to keep with the lineup of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but Donatello really just didn't have as much iconic work as Botticelli, so we're going with Botticelli. Botticelli was a Florentine painter and draftsman, and he was one of the most esteemed artists in Italy. He drew these amazing, graceful pictures of the Madonna and, and child, um, and his altarpieces and his life-size mythological paintings, such as Venus and Mars, were immensely popular in his lifetime. And his most famous and recognizable painting is The Birth of Venus, which is about the creation of Aphrodite. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of Renaissance life and culture. And we're going to leave it there and move eastward and look at what's going on in the Byzantine Empire and how the world is beginning to shift its balance of power more and more towards Europe and what sets up the age of exploration that will come at the end of the 15th century. Now, in your reading for this week, you'll learn about what was going on in the rest of the world outside of Europe in the century before the age of exploration and what most scholars consider to be the start of the modern world. And 
that reading really is very powerful. So I'm not going to go into what it discusses here because I want you to enjoy what you'll learn from there. But before I finish up this lecture, I just wanted to take a quick look at the Byzantine Empire and the subsequent Ottoman Empire and just some common misconceptions that you may or may not have about the start of the modern era as well as the age of exploration. So after the drama of the Crusades, Byzantium faced increasing domestic problems. Uh, but on top of that, they were facing these fresh foreign challenges as well. Um, Europeans began advancing from the west and nomadic Turkish peoples were invading from the east. And most important among them were the Muslim Seljuk Turks who, beginning in the early, early 11th century, sent wave after wave of invaders into Anatolia. Anatolia is the area of Turkey, uh, modern day Turkey. And it was the agricultural heartland of the Byzantine Empire. So given the military and financial problems of Byzantium, the Seljuks found it pretty much ripe for plunder. So in 1071, they handed the Byzantine Empire a demoralizing defeat at the Battle of Manzikert, and Byzantine forces then turned on each other in a civil war, allowing the Seljuks almost free reign in Anatolia. And by the 12th century, the Seljuks had seized almost all of Anatolia and crusaders from Western Europe held the remainder. Now, the loss of Anatolia pretty much sealed the fate of the Byzantine Empire, and this now territorially truncated Byzantium survived until the mid-15th century, but it enjoyed very little autonomy and faced a series of challenges. But in 1453, the final blow came, um, and the Byzantine Empire came to an end as Ottoman Turks, under the dynamic leadership of a then 21-year-old Sultan Mehmed II, captured Constantinople and absorbed Byzantium's last remaining territories into their realm. And the Eastern Roman Empire had survived from the days of Constantine, but in 1453, the Muslim Ottoman Turks finally conquered it, initiating the Ottoman Empire, which would actually last well into the 20th century and end only after World War I in 1918. Now, as we all know, with the influx of the Seljuk and then Ottoman Turks, European trade with the East was blockaded by Muslim traders because they were mean and they hated Europe. So this forced the Europeans to find another way to China and India, namely by way of sailing around Africa. But this was still a super long and difficult journey, so Christopher Columbus had to find a faster way by sailing west across the Pacific. Actually, 100% of what I just said is incorrect. <laughs> but that's the story of what many of us think happened to start the Age of Exploration. But if you really just take like two seconds to think about it, it doesn't make sense. The trade routes through Palestine and Southwest Asia that we have been told Muslims blockaded to Europeans were actually incredibly lucrative for whoever controlled them. So when the Seljuks and the Ottomans took over Anatolia, they actually tried really hard to continue maintaining those trade routes because they were so profitable to their empires. It wouldn't make any sense to stop European trade because that would cut off their um, that would cut off their wealth supply. But the trade routes themselves were actually starting to fall apart, and that's why the Europeans began looking for other ways to get to Asia. Because despite Muslim efforts to maintain the trade routes, it was further down the line in the newly ended Mongol Empire that things were problematic. After the Mongol Empire had fallen apart, that made significant chunks of major trade routes extremely unsafe and impassable. Um, and in addition, it did, it was complicated by the fact that the Europeans were trying to cut ties with the Muslims because of the bitter losses of the Crusades, and Roman popes were encouraging European merchants to find alternate routes to their destinations that didn't involve filling the coffers of the Muslims. So that is how the Age of Exploration really got started, was because of not the mean and terrible Muslims, but rather a desire for a safer, quicker route to Africa. And in actuality, while it may look on a map like the sea route around Africa was much longer than the land route through the Southwest Asia, in reality, sea travel was much more reliable than land travel. It was safer, it was reliable, it was quicker even a lot of the time. Land travel was just entirely unpredictable. You could lose a lot of your goods and your people to disease and to bandits, and that was just a lot less likely on the sea routes. So it looks like a worse route, but it actually was a better one, and that's why people were taking it. 
So this is where we end our journey through the history of the world from ancient Mesopotamian people to the Ottomans and early modern Europe. Um, we've seen empires rise and fall, religions that both united and divided people, and individuals whose singular efforts made massive impacts on the flow of history and time. I just want to say, since this is our last lecture, thank you all for joining me on this journey. Um, I didn't tell anybody this at the beginning of the semester because I just didn't want you to know and judge me, but this was my very first time teaching a college course all by myself. I have lots of teaching experience, but this was my first time really controlling and guiding a class myself. So I know it was messy. I know it wasn't perfect. There, I made some changes and there were some bumps along the way. So I appreciate your patience with me. Um, thank you for teaching me. You all taught me so much. I feel like I... I learned a lot more about what it means to be a teacher from you all. Um, and so, most of all, I hope that you learned something from this class. I hope you walk away having remembered something that I taught you um, and that it stays with you throughout your life. So, also, I hope that when you leave this class, you continue on in your pursuit of knowledge and truth, not only about the past, but about the present and the future as well. Thank you. Thank you.